Well, I appreciate uh, Brother Rob giving me the opportunity uh, to share again this week. I, it's good for me. I don't know how good it is for you, but we'll see here. I'll uh, try to be done a little quicker than normal. Uh, I brought a watch today, and I'm uh, actually going to keep time. So anyway, uh, we're going to be pre- I'm going to be preaching from uh, the passage, uh, a passage in the book of Philippians, chapter three. So, and I would, as Rob said, I would like you to follow along because I, I I'm going to do some hopping around today. And not only are we going to be in the book of Philippians, but we're also going to be in the book of Acts, and I'll explain why uh, here in just a minute. But uh, before we get into today's focal passage, I just wanted to. Uh, kind of share a little bit uh, that God has put on my heart the last couple of weeks. You know, since I preached a few weeks ago, uh, this same thing has been on my heart. And uh, I was planning on going at one time, I was planning on going to the conference that Brother Rob uh, talked about and went to, but he, he kind of hijacked me. And uh, <laughs> no, 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 I had already decided I couldn't go and uh, so forth. It was too late when I found out, but I really wanted to go and and just sit and listen for a while, but I'm glad, you know, some people in the church got to go and enjoy the preaching. But uh, for the last few weeks, or even maybe longer than that, you know, God has really impressed on my heart the need to really be serious in my walk with the Lord. And just to give you a little bit of personal testimony, um, when my wife passed away a year ago, it really, really kind of rocked my world. And, and um, you know, when you think about an event like that, that happens, it's so often, uh, you think it would, in one sense, it drives you to the Lord, but in another way, it makes you pull away from the Lord. I don't know how to explain that unless you've gone through it. But there is this sense in which I questioned everything. And I questioned everything that I believed I question whether I, my life was right with God. Why would this happen? You know, there's a little bit of that prosperity gospel, I think, that's worked its way into all of our lives, that, that if we live a good life, what we say is a good life, that God's going to reward us for, for our human effort. And, you know, what I went through with my wife having cancer and, and the year or so that, that she dealt with that, um, really taught me a different story than that, you know. Sometimes God puts us through those difficult times to grow us and stretch us. And, and the passage we're going to look at today in the life of the Apostle Paul, you're going to see some of that. He's going to refer to some of the suffering that he's gone through and the hardships. And last week, if you remember the message Brother Rob preached, he recounted some of the things that the Apostle Paul went through. And as I went home from last Sunday's message and thought about it, you know, I, I, I thought about some of the things that he endured for his faith in Christ. And, and it kept coming up, the, 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 the lashes, the whippings, the beatings that he took just kept coming to my mind. And I kept thinking, you know, all this man endured for the cause of Christ. Five times he endured the 40 lashes minus one. You know, I can't imagine, you know, I thought about this. What did the guy's back look like? What did his back look like? I mean, he no sooner would get healed and and then again, another whipping would come or a beating with rods. And and I think of all these things that he went through and yet they, they brought him to this place of intimacy with God that nothing else in this life would. And I experienced some of that in my own life as I went through the, the suffering and the pain of losing a loved one. Someone, it's more than when you lose a spouse, it's like, it's like you, you cut half of your body off. And, and you, you have to deal with that in some way. And there, it, it almost, there, there were times when I didn't even care if I woke up in the morning, you know. And, and I, I disappointed myself. You know, I kept saying, you know, I, I know the truth, and I, I have the truth that indwells me. The Holy Spirit indwells me, but yet I struggled. And, uh, and I think that's okay. I, I think that struggle is part of, of coming to know God in a deeper way. And as I went through that, I'm still going through that to some degree, you know, and always will be. But, you know, it, it has driven me. It's taken a while to really, but it's driven me into the presence of God in a deeper way. And, and, and so a, a, as a result of that, what he, God's been doing in my life, he, he's made me really ask this question. And I see the answer in the life of the Apostle Paul. He's asked this question, what does real biblical Christianity look like? 
What does it look like in the life of a genuine believer? Not a pretend believer. Not someone who, who just uses their Christianity as a, as a way to feel good, that they uh, are checking that off of the box, that I'm making an effort and God is going to pat me on the back. I, I'm being a good person. Not that kind of Christianity. Because that's not biblical Christianity. What is biblical Christianity? When we look at this passage of Scripture in Philippians chapter 3, I think we see it. We see it. And we, so often we look at this and we say, wow, this guy had an unbelievable, unbelievable commitment to Christ. But this is normal Christianity. This is biblical Christianity. What we see in our culture is far from biblical Christianity. It requires nothing from you. Once you give your life to Christ, I mean, Jesus tells his disciples to take up the cross and to follow him. As I preached a couple of weeks ago, it's about a dying to self. There is a real death that takes place when you come to Christ. You die to self so that you may live for Christ. And we're going to see that exemplified in the life of the Apostle Paul. And what I want to do today, I want to look at this passage of Scripture, read through it, because I want you to make a connection between this passage and what happens in Acts chapter 9, which is the conversion of the Apostle Paul. And I want to flip back there and read that. Because what you're going to hear today as we read through this passage of Scripture and as we look into the Word of God, what you're going to see is what's going on in the mind and the heart of the Apostle Paul at the time of his conversion and in the years that follow. As Paul writes this letter to the church at Philippi, he has been a believer for approximately 30 years. He writes from prison. He writes from a Roman prison, chained to a guard, day and night. He does have certain freedoms. He can receive visitors. He can write. He can, do, he can even share the gospel in his imprisonment. But he is in prison. He's been in prison, first in Jerusalem and then in Caesarea, and now he's in Rome awaiting his trial there. And probably somewhere in the neighborhood of three to four year period, he's been in jail. And yet, as he writes this letter, the letter of Philippians, it has become known as the letter of joy. And how is it that a man can be stripped of everything, can literally be stripped of his freedom, can be forced to live in prison for multiple years, and yet have such joy in his life? How, how is that possible? Well, this passage of Scripture, I think, gives us a glimpse into that, what's going on in his heart and his mind. And again, I want to look and, and show you how that came to be uh, in Acts chapter 9. But if you would stand with me in the honor of reading the Word of God, we're going to begin in verse 7. We're actually jumping into the middle of this, but I am going to refer back to verses 5 and 6 a little bit as we work our way through it. But beginning in verse 7... Uh, Paul writes again from prison, and he's writing, and he says this, but, and again, he's making a contrast, and we're going to go back and look at what he's contrasting here with, the, with this statement. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain or acquire the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, I just pray that your Holy Spirit will illuminate this passage today as we read, as we talk about it, as we pull things from it, Father. I pray that you would protect us from error and that you would help us, Lord, to rightly divide the word of truth. I pray that in doing so, Lord, that, that Jesus Christ will be seen for who he is and that surpassing value or that surpassing worth or that surpassing greatness that he is will be made clear in our eyes today and that he will be glorified and magnified in everything we do. And it's in his precious name that we pray. Amen. As I mentioned, I, I want you to keep a finger in the book of Philippians, if you would. And uh, I'm going to ask you to flip forward into the book of Acts. And I just lost my bookmark there, so give me a, a few minutes to, to get there. But Acts chapter, we're actually going to go to Acts chapter 7, because I want you to see who Paul was, and I want you to see the difference that Christ has made in his life. So we're going to be contrasting today who Paul was with who he is in Christ. And then what we're going to do, we're going to hold that up to our lives you know, do we see this kind of dramatic change in our life? Because though you may not have been persecuting Christians, you may not have been traveling on the road to Damascus, you are every bit a sinner as the Apostle Paul was a sinner. Your salvation is just as dramatic going from, from uh, wretched sinner to righteous saint. I mean, that's a dramatic transformation that God brings into the life of an individual by faith alone. And we're going to talk about that today as we move through. But I want to, want to begin at the end of Acts chapter 7. And I'm going to start in about verse 57 or so. Not a good place to start here. But I just want you to notice one thing. This is the first mention of the future Apostle Paul. Now, I, I want to make this clear. Paul never had his name changed. You know, I, sometimes you'll hear that, that God changed his name. God did not change Paul's name. His name was always Paul. That was his Greek name. Saul is his Hebrew name. So when he, when in the book of Acts chapter 13, there's a switch where he, he goes to the Gentiles. He begins his missionary journeys in Acts chapter 13. And from then on, he's referred to as Paul. So up to this point, he's still Saul. He's still being referred to in the book of Acts as Saul. And we see in verse 57 of chapter 7, it says this. Now, we're jumping into the middle of the stoning of Stephen, the first recorded martyr for the faith. Stephen has been uh, uh, tried before the Sanhedrin, and, and they're dragging him out of the outside of town. They're going to they're gonna stone him to death. And I just want you to notice this. It says, but he cried out, speaking of Stephen, he cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears. And, and he cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. And they cast him out of the city and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of the young man named Saul. Okay, this is the first mention of Saul. He's, a, he's young at this time, probably a contemporary of Christ. We don't know if he was in the city of Jerusalem during the ministry of Christ. He may well have been. Uh, the Bible never tells us that information. But uh, he's, he's young. He may be in his early 20s at this time. And again, this is about 30 years prior to the writing of the book of, the, uh, the book of Philippians. And uh, so anyway, we see this. He goes on and, and writes and it says this. And as they were stoning Stephen... He called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. The reason I want you to see that is because uh, Stephen was a godly man who gave his life for Christ. And I think this is a pivotal moment. Even though Paul does not get saved at this time in his life, I think it's a pivotal moment in his life where he sees this man lay down his life. And I think, you know, God's already beginning to work in his life. I, ha I have no doubt about that. As he sees this young man give his life for Christ and uh, so forth. But I want to move on down into, into chapter 8. Now listen to what's going on around this same time as Stephen is stoned and Paul has given his consent. And it says, and, and Saul approved of his execution. And there, are, there arose on that day, right after the stoning of Stephen, a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered, meaning the believers, 
They were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Okay, Paul is attempting in his uh, prosecution and, and execution of, of Stephen to stop the spread of Christianity and to, and to kill the church is what he's trying to do. At this time, the church has grown uh, into the thousands and this passage is telling us that following the execution, everything broke loose. And Christians were fair game. So what happens? Christians begin to leave the city and go to surrounding regions. And what Paul is attempting to kill, he's actually being used by God to spread the gospel. And I'll show you what I mean as we read through this. Uh, it says, verse 2, devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentations over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now look at verse 4. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. So this persecution, all it did was, was cause the gospel to be spread because everyone who left shared the truth about Jesus Christ. They shared the gospel wherever they, wherever they went. I just want you to see that God uses these difficulties and these sufferings. He even uses the death of a saint to further the work of the kingdom. As Stephen laid down his, his life, God is using the blood of the martyrs to spread the truth of the gospel is what he's doing. And so the gospel continues to spread despite all the efforts to, to kill it and to stamp it out. But I want to move over into verse or chapter 9, verse 1, and here's where I want to settle for just a minute. Um, but I wanted you to see Saul, who he was. He's a young man. He's on fire for his faith. He is uh, offended at Christianity. He sees it as a blight. He's a religious fundamentalist is what he is. And anything that is opposed to his religion is evil, and, and he has a, a hate for it. He's going to talk about having a zeal. Well, zeal is not just passion and enthusiasm. Zeal also means this. It means anything that God hates, I hate. Anything that is against God, I'm against. And so Paul is seeing this new faith as being against God and against Judaism. And as a result, there's hate in his heart. And, and violence erupts out of his heart. And he even tells us that in the book of Galatians, that he persecuted the church violently, he said. And this passage that we just read tells us he was dragging people out of homes, separating families, having people put on trial and put to death, consenting all the time to everything, agreeing to it, giving his stamp of approval to what was going on uh, at that particular time. But listen to what happens to him. Now, I want you to see, this is not a man who was seeking Jesus Christ. This is a man who was seeking to stamp out any belief in Jesus Christ. He believed Jesus Christ to be a phony, to be a heretic, to be a blasphemer, and he wanted to put an end to it. And this is what happens. Verse 1 of chapter 9, But Saul, still, notice what it says, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, he went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue at Damascus. Now, it's not good enough just to persecute Christians in Jerusalem and the surrounding cities, he wants to travel north outside of, of, of Israel and, and into the city of Damascus. So he's, he's going to travel, he's going to get authority from the high priest to, to go into that city and arrest anyone who is a follower of Jesus Christ. He asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if, if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And so he sets off on this mission. Somewhere along the way to the city of Damascus, this happens, verse 3. Now as he went on his way he, and approached Damascus, uh, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. We know from his testimony in the book of Acts he, that he says this was a light that was even brighter than the sun. So there is this bright light that flashes before him, and, and he falls to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you persecute, whom you are persecuting. I want you to notice that. 
Because this, again, is going to have a huge impact on the life of the Apostle Paul. This whole event is going to have a huge impact on the life of the Apostle Paul. But notice what he says. Paul has not personally met Jesus, as far as we know. It's never recorded in Scripture. But yet Jesus says, you're, you're persecuting me. And I want you to see that, that the Lord sees the persecution of his followers as persecution of himself. So there's this intimacy. There's such a union between Christ and his followers, Christ and his believers, between Christ and, and God's children, his, his adopted sons and daughters. There's such a connection there, a oneness of spirit, that any attack on one of his children is attack on him. And so that, I think, is a, a moment of enlightenment as well. But he says this, And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But, he, but rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. Now, I want you to see this. What I want you to see in this passage is God just intervenes in the middle of Paul's life. Paul was not looking for some spiritual answer here. He was not searching for meaning in life. He thought he had everything in order. He was proud, of, and we're going to see that in the Philippians passage. He was proud of his pedigree. He was proud of a lot of things in his life. He was zealous for the Lord. He was doing the work of God, he believed. And then all of a sudden he meets Jesus on the road to Damascus. And he finds out in this moment that everything he believes is wrong. All that he's poured into his life, all of the teaching and, and so forth about keeping the law and, and earning righteousness by keeping the law. He finds out that all of this stuff is wrong and in a matter of a moment. And his life is really turned upside down. And so God gives him instructions. I want you to listen to this as we move through it. But he says, Arise, enter the city, and you, and, and you will be told what you are to do. And the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. And Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by hand um, and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate or drank. And then this happens, verse 10. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise up and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and laying his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered. Listen to Ananias' answer. Lord, I have heard... From many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on the name. But the Lord said to him, go. Go. And he says this, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. I just, I think that is so unbelievable right there. Ananias has an objection. Lord, this, this, he's an enemy. He's an enemy. We're all enemies. That's what I, I, I think we don't get that. We don't get the depth of our depravity and, and the fact that we're all enemies of God before we come to Christ. And, and Ananias sees Paul as someone to be feared. He wants nothing to do with him. But yet God has chosen him. Get that. God has chosen him. He's elected him. He's chosen him, not just for faith, but also for a specific person, purpose. And he's, go he's going to be my chosen instrument to carry my name to the Gentiles. And notice this, and kings and the children of Israel. And I will show him, notice this in verse 16. Rob alluded to this last week in his, in his message. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. And so Ananias entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road to Damascus by which you came has sent me so that you may re regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So what you're reading is the salvation experience of the Apostle Paul. This is how Paul came to meet the Lord. This is how we all come to meet the Lord. We're confronted 
with the reality of who Christ is. And Paul yields his life. There's never, there's never any question. It's just, what do you want me to do? That's it. It's never why, who. He never doubts who Christ is. He knows who Christ is. He's, he's seen him here in this, this vision of, of light. He's seen, him in his, he's seen this vision of his glory in some way. Christ manifested his glory that day on the road to Damascus. And Paul's life is forever changed. Now, it caused in his life, if you go on to read chapter, chapter 9, what you see is that immediately his life is different. He gives up everything and begins to share the gospel. And the, the people, the Jews of Jerusalem, plot to kill him and he has to be smuggled out of the city, let down over the city wall in a basket that Rob referred to again last week. So we're not going to spend any time on that. I just want you to see this is how it happened. This is how his conversion experience took place. But what we're going to see is what happened in his heart as a result. That's what we see in Philippians chapter 3. I want to begin in verse 7. I want to talk really about three things today. And I know you're thinking, man, you've already gone through a lot of stuff. But we'll hit these pretty quick. Uh, you could camp out in this passage for weeks, really. But we, we're not going to be able to do that today. But I want you to see three things under the heading of there is no greater thing. How could Paul have joy in prison? How could Paul give up everything? How could Paul go from who he was to what he became? Well, this is how, right here. This is how it happens. And I want us first to look at, he came to this realization that Christ is greater than everything. Okay? I want to read verses 7 and 8 uh, to you right now. But... Whatever gain I had at that moment of his conversion, at that moment when he met Christ on the road to Damascus, this is going on in his heart. But whatever gain I had, I counted loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I counted everything as loss because of the surpassing worth or the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, or on, because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. On that road to, to Damascus, he saw the futility of human effort. Let me, let me just give you three things that Paul was putting his faith in. Let's back up to verse 5 as he gives his pedigree, his reason to boast in the flesh. Verse 5, he says this, he was circumcised on the eighth day. He was as, literally it says, he was an eighth dayer. What does that mean? It means he followed the law even before he was able to make a choice. He was born to devout parents. We're not going to go into all of these, but this is his religious pedigree. This is his religious inheritance. And so often that's what happens in the life of an individual, is we put our faith in our birthright. You know, I was born into a Christian family. You know, so my faith kind of comes to me by osmosis. You know, I was born into a Christian family. You know, I, I, as I've shared before, there was never a time in my life that I doubted that God existed or even doubted that Jesus Christ was his only begotten son. I never doubted that, ever. But the knowledge of that, just the knowledge of that can't change me. You know, there had to be a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. There had to be a moment when I put my faith solely in him. And that had to happen for the Apostle Paul as well. But what happened on that road to Damascus, it says, whatever gain I had, he looks back over all these things, the circumcision on the eighth day uh, of the people. He was an Israelite. He was not a convert to Judaism. He was an Israelite. He was born of the tribe of Benjamin, the, the tribe of the first king, one of the tribes that stayed loyal to the nation of Israel. Or uh, when the kingdom was split in two, two tribes, Judah and uh, Benjamin were the only two tribes that stayed faithful to God. The other ten tribes split off and, and, and started worshiping an idol. And you can read about that in the book uh, in the Old Testament in the history of Israel. But Benjamin was one of those that stayed faithful. It's also the region that was given to the tribe of Benjamin when, when the land was distributed. It's the region where Jerusalem was, the capital city, the holy city. You know, I mean, there was much pride in the fact that Paul was from the tribe of, of Benjamin. But he had nothing to do with that. And that couldn't earn him any favor with God. 
The fact that he was circumcised on the eighth day, the fact that he was an Is Israelite, the fact that he was born of the tribe of Benjamin, that was simply his religious heritage. And what Paul had done up to that time is think, because I have this religious heritage, God will have favor on me. Well, God will not have favor on you because you have religious heritage. Heritage, religious heritage may be a sign of God's grace in your life. He's being gracious. It's a, it's a grace that he's given to you, one you don't deserve to be raised with the knowledge of who he is. I mean, that's a, that's a definite blessing, but it will not make you right with God. The other thing we see in his life is these religious achievements. He's a Pharisee, the strictest tribe or the strictest sect of Judaism. Only 6,000 of them existed at the time of uh, the first century. Only 6,000 people were qualified to be in that sect. And they kept the law to the T, jotting, dotting every I, crossing every T, being very legalistic about the keeping of the law. And Paul was that. And that he was a religious achiever here. And he thought again that because I'm keeping the law, because I'm doing everything that the law requires, that God will bestow his favor upon me. So I have heritage, I have achievements, and then we see this last thing. Listen to what he says. Um, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. So he had so much zeal, so much enthusiasm, that he was a persecutor of the church. And he was well-known persecutor of the church. He has a religious reputation, Paul does. And that's another thing sometimes we put our faith in and trust in. Because I, I'm a big shot at the church. We never say that to ourselves. But I'm a deacon. I serve at the church. You know, I'm a Sunday school teacher. I'm, I'm a worker there. I'm, I'm doing my part, you know. You may be serving God, but you're not earning God's favor. None of that will change the heart of a man. Here's the problem. Paul learned that day that his heart was still wicked. Even though he had all these external things going on in his life that one might say were commendable, his heart was still sinful and corrupt. And nothing you can do on the outside will ever clean the inside. And so what Paul came to realize that day is verse 7, whatever gain, all these things I thought were a benefit or a profit. It's the idea of the word gain. All these things I thought were a benefit to me, I now look at them and I see that they're a loss. What Paul is doing, he's using, he's using accounting terms here. You know, a profit and loss statement is what Paul is talking about. I made a, a column over here, and I had all of these achievements on my birthright, my religious heritage, you know, all these things were in that column. And, and it was full. It was full. I had done everything I could do. And in the lost column, really, there's nothing. You know, I had a solid reputation. You know, as to righteousness under the law, I was blameless. He's not saying he was sinless, but he's saying I kept the law to the fullest. You know, no one could point at me and say, hey, you broke this law. Paul didn't. He was that zealous about it. And so all of this, his prophet side of the ledger was full. Well, what happened that day on the road to Damascus is all of a sudden everything in that column got moved to the loss column. The loss is the idea of deficit. Not only is it not gaining him anything, it's actually subtracting all the works you know, they, they really, they take away. They don't add to, they take away. Because it, it fools you into thinking that you're right with God, this workspace righteousness that Paul was involved in. It had him thinking that he was right with God and it was keeping him from really knowing the one true God and his son Jesus Christ. And on that day on the Damascus Road, he saw that and he moved everything from that column into the lost column. I counted, this is a past tense statement. There was a time in his life where he took an inventory, and that was on that road to Damascus. And he moved all of this stuff that he was so proud of that he thought made him acceptable to God and made him righteous. He moved that into the lost column, and he realized that he stood before God as an unrighteous man, just like all of us. And all the religious achievement, all the religious heritage, you know, the, even the religious reputation will never 
be on the prophet side of a ledger. The only thing that will ever be there is the righteousness of Christ. The righteousness of Christ. That's what he's going to find out. I counted it a loss. I put it over there because I, I wanted to know Christ. I met him on that road to Damascus, and I, I wanted to know him and to know him deeply for the sake of Christ, he says. Indeed, I count. Now notice this word is present tense. The first count, counted, was past tense. So what Paul is saying is I do this. This is an ongoing process in my life. I'm continually counting everything in this life as a loss. You know, man, that's a dramatic statement to make. Because, you know, we do not live that way. You know? You know, to count everything in this loss, this life, a loss. I count everything a loss. And why does he do that? Because there's something greater. There's something greater that I've discovered. I discovered it on the road to Damascus, and I've kept growing in my discovery of it for the past 30 years, he's telling us. You know, and that's my relationship with Jesus Christ, knowing him. Knowing, the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. This idea of knowing is not head knowledge. Paul had, had head knowledge of Jesus before the Damascus road. But he met him in person on the Damascus road. And he submitted to him as Lord on the Damascus road. There's a difference in knowing about Christ. This is where biblical Christianity separates from cultural Christianity. Cultural Christianity is built on a knowledge of Christ. We know who he is and, and we even accept who he is. But that's not Christianity. The demons believe and tremble, the Bible says. They know who Jesus is, but it doesn't make a difference to them. And it won't make a difference to you unless you surrender to it. Lay down your life to it like Paul did. And so we're selling Christianity short in this country. We're selling, uh, selling a Christianity that costs nothing. It's just feel good Christianity. There, there's nothing tied to it. There's no substance. There's no service required. Jesus says, like I shared before, take up your cross and follow me. That's what we're called to do. We're not called just to have a relationship with Jesus once a week. He wants your life every day. He wants to use you where he's put you. You know, he's scattered the seed of, of believers into the field of the world. All over this town and this community, he's put you where you are, working side by side or, or living side by side with people who need to know the truth. They need to see the truth lived out in your life. They need to see that you're different from the world. They need to hear who Jesus is. They need to hear the truth of the gospel and God's put you there. Are you willing to obey that? Or do you just ignore that call on your life and say, I'm okay, I believe in Jesus. But has Jesus changed your life? Do you live differently? What we, do you see what Paul is doing? Paul lives differently. He, Paul's thinking differently. That's what repentance is. We've taken repentance away from Christianity today. There's no repentance preached anymore. What, what you're seeing in, in Paul's life here is he's thinking differently. That's the essence of repentance. God has changed my mind. Now, instead of moving away from God in direction, I'm, I've changed my mind. I've turned 180 degree, degrees and I'm heading towards God. That's biblical Christianity. It's repenting and turning towards God. And that's what we see in the life of the Apostle Paul here. The surpassing worth, nothing in this life. Paul had it all. An extremely high education. Came from a wealthy family. Traveled to Jerusalem to study under the most renowned rabbi of his day. Had the equivalent, some scholars say, of four PhDs. As Rob mentioned, had most, if not all, of the Old Testament memorized. I mean, he was, uh, in his day, he was a spiritual giant. He was a young and upcoming man and well known for that. And yet, listen to what he says. I counted everything a loss because there was something greater out there. Not just something good. There was something that, that was everything, okay? He's not just saying exchange something good for something a little bit better. He's saying 
This is everything. This is worth giving everything for. It's the pearl of great price. I'd sell everything so I could be with Christ. I'd give everything because it surpasses. It's held above is the idea of the word. It's held above. To hold above is what it means. It's held above everything else. For his sake, I have counted, I have, notice this, I have suffered the loss of all things. Do you think it was easy to walk away from everything he had? Religious reputation, a devout Jewish family. He walked away from all of that. They would have disowned him. The Bible doesn't record it, but that's the standard practice for any Jew that converts to Christianity is you're disowned. They, they literally have a funeral for you, and you are shunned by the family. You're dead to them. Paul gave it up. He gave up a chance to to be a, one, of the, one of the men that led the nation of Israel. He gave that up. He was up and coming. He says in the book of Galatians that he was surpassing all his contemporaries. You know? He was the star, the rising star. And he gave it up because he found and discovered something more valuable. Notice what he says. I, I suffered. There was pain involved. This was a painful thing to live for Christ. Because it called him to sacrifice and give up. And he's not just talking about the pain of ministry. He's talking about the pain of walking away from everything he held dear to his life. You know, his heritage, his achievements, his reputation. He walked away from all that. Because they were nothing, listen, this is how he sees them. They were nothing more than, my translation says, a pile of rubbish. Okay? That's the Greek word skubalon. And it's a pretty graphic word. And Paul is saying it's, it's not just common trash. I mean, it, it's two common uses in Greek uh, uh, at the time of the first century was to describe the leftovers from a, from a table, like a feast, the parts that weren't edible. And they would be taken out and thrown on the ground and given to the dogs. Okay, that's one translate, one way, one thing the word means. I always remember that word scuba long. It reminds me of Scooby-Doo. Yeah, for some reason, that comes to my mind whenever I hear it. And so it's easy to remember. But, uh, but anyway, what another meaning is the two main uses. The other meaning is for waste, like human waste, excrement, or manure. Animal manure is what it is. And so Paul is describing something that has absolutely no redeeming value at all. There's nothing good left in it. So that's, what it, that's how he sees his old life. Everything he held dear is now just a pile of manure, is what he's saying. And that's pretty graphic. But that's the way he sees it in his heart, because he's seen Christ. Remember, he knows who Christ is. He saw him on the road to Damascus, and that vision of Christ will never leave his mind. And it transformed his behavior. My question is, do the, does the Jesus that you see in Scripture, does he elicit that kind of response from you? And you say, well, if I saw him on the road to Damascus, it might. No, because he reveals himself in the same way through the Word of God. You know, he reveals himself. It's not what Paul really saw. It's what happened in his heart. And so that moment on the Damascus Road, he moved everything from the prophet column to the lost column. There was nothing left there but Christ's righteousness. I want us to see this second point. Not only is Christ greater than everything, but I want us to, want us to see this. Christ has everything that we need. Christ has the righteousness that we need. And he says it this way. I considered them rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. The one thing in this column that Paul is going to have the prophet column is Christ. That's it. Everything else is in the lost column. And listen to how he says it. And be found in him. Paul uses this phrase over a hundred times in his letters. In him, in Christ, he is uh, trying to emphasize the relational aspect of a personal walk with Christ. There is a real relationship. There is a real union that takes place in the life of a believer, an intertwining of our life with the very life of Christ through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our life. And Paul, he, he wants that. 
And he wants that to continue to grow. He wants to know Christ and to know more and more and more. And, and he's expressing that. He wants to be found. That's his location. He wants to be found in him. Not having, notice this, he now realizes that this self-righteous pursuit that he was on is futile. He says it this way, not having a righteousness of my own, there is no righteousness of my own. I don't care what you do in this life. You know, I, don't, I don't care what you give up and sacrifice without Christ, without giving your life to Christ. There's nothing, there's nothing that you can do to gain one speck of righteousness in this life. The writer of Isaiah says it this way, all our righteousness is filthy rags. And if you have ever studied that, the use of the word filthy rags, if you haven't, go do that. It's another very graphic term that tells us how worthless, how utterly worthless human effort is in our attempt to be made right with God. There is no being made right with God by human effort. Paul says it this way in the book of Galatians, by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. No one, not a single person who ever lived, was ever made right by keeping the law or keeping rules and regulations. Zero. Of all the billions of people that have walked the face of the earth, not a single person was ever made right. No flesh, no man, was ever made right by keeping the law. Paul has come to understand that. And so he doesn't want this man-made righteousness. He's in the pursuit. Look what he, what he says about it. That comes from the law. He doesn't want that righteousness because that righteousness falls way short. It, it isn't righteousness at all. But that which comes through faith. Faith in what? Faith in Christ. That's what he's after. He's after this righteousness that comes from Christ, that depends on faith, that is based upon faith. And he goes on and says, that I may know him. Know him is this idea of intimacy. It's a, a, a term of uh, experience. Paul's not wanting to just know intellectually. He's wanting to know personally. It describes a love relationship. The word know is, it describes the relationship a man has with his wife. Okay. I mean, it's a relationship of intimacy. Paul's saying, I want intimacy with Christ. I want to be intimate with him. And I want to know, listen to what this relationship or this righteousness that comes from Christ alone, listen to what it brings into his life. I want to know him so it brings an in-depth knowledge of the person of Jesus Christ. It also brings power. It's the Greek word dunamis here. It means like explosive power, the power to achieve. Paul wants the power to achieve in his life. And that could come only through the, the power of the Holy Spirit working in the life of the believer. What the Holy Spirit does, he tells us in this book, chapter 2, verse 13. God is working in us to will and to do according to his good pleasure. What is Paul saying in that verse? He's saying, first of all, God's changing your heart. And he's giving you a heart that longs for obedience. But he doesn't, that's not all God does. Not only does he give you the desire to obey and the desire to honor him with your life, but he gives you the ability to do that. He gives you the power, the dunamis, to do that through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You know, that's another way you can check your life. Do you have the kind of faith, do you have the kind of relationship with Jesus Christ that leads you to a des inward desire to honor him with the way you live your life. And do the things that he knows that a believer should be doing. Because, you know, the book, of, uh, the book of Ephesians tells us that we're saved by faith through grace, but it also tells us that he has ordained good works for us to do. They don't have anything to do with us earning salvation. They're a result of salvation. It's the fruit of your life. And so for the believer, there's got to be fruit. There are no fruitless trees in the kingdom of God, you know. And so you can examine your life. Do you have that desire? If you have that desire, I mean, you can trust that God has given you the power, the dunamis in your life to achieve. Not for your glory, for his glory. It's not you doing it, it's him doing it. He gets the credit. 
And then to share in his sufferings. I wanted to talk about this briefly. We're, we're almost done, and uh, we'll wrap up here shortly. But this idea of suffering, you know, Paul has suffered greatly by this point in his life. He's in prison, for goodness sakes. You know, he's in prison. He's suffered with the countless beatings. He's uh, gone with, I mean, you could just read the list. He's spent days on the open sea, uh, shipwrecked, and uh, all kinds of things. And, he, and he's experienced real suffering. What is that suffering related? That's what I was getting at when I opened up today. This suffering, this suffering pulls us in deeper to Christ. I'm going to tell you this. You're going to suffer in this life. You know, don't be afraid of it. You know, I was, I'll be honest with you, I was afraid of it. You know, that moment when I was fortunate to be at my wife's bedside when she passed and to hold her hand. But there's, uh, there's that moment when you realize they're gone. You know, they're just gone. They're just, they were there and now they're gone, you know. I have no doubt where she is at all, anything like that. But there's that realization, and, and you're struck with this, this little bit of fear, if not horror, at this idea that now life moves on. And, but, you know, I, I think of the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4 where he said this, All had deserted me, but the Lord stood by me. You know, what I learned in those moments was as alone as I thought I was, that God was standing by me. He was right there. And, and in the suffering of that moment, that's, that's a little different suffering than Paul is talking about suffering for his faith. But suffering is suffering, and God is there in the midst of it. And there's something about suffering that helps you know him more. So what Paul is saying, that, that what he wants, I want to suffer. I mean, I know it sounds sadistic, but what he's saying, I want to know Christ. And I want the fellowship of his sufferings, the koinonia that comes as I suffer, as my Savior suffered, and I experience some of what he experienced, and it unites us even deeper. I want that in my life. Do you want that in your life? I mean, really, we should. I'm not saying we seek persecution. Paul didn't seek persecution. It came to him, you know. But he wants by, by any means, he goes on to say this, becoming like him in his death. I mean, it's the idea of being conformed, being pushed into the mold. He wants to be like Jesus so desperately. That's the passion of his life. I want to jump on down. I mean, he's looking for the final, the resurrection, when he will finally attain what he's, it's the idea of arriving at a final destination. Paul's looking forward to that. Then this last point I want to make, and we'll just go through this rather quickly, and that's that Christ is the passionate pursuit and reward, you know, of your life as a believer. What are you pursuing with your life? If you had to take an inventory of your life and just honestly look at it, what would you say is the main pursuit of your life? You know, that'll tell you where your treasure is. That'll tell you what's important. If Christ is important, he'll be the pursuit of your life. He'll be what you care about the most. Everything else will fall in order. Seek you first, the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. God's not wanting to withhold anything from you, but he's, he, he wants to be preeminent in your life. And I'm telling you, you want him to be preeminent in your life because you will experience a relationship like Paul experienced when you do that. Without that, you never will. You'll have a shallow form of Christianity. And we settle for that. We settle for, for life in the, in the shallow end when God wants to get us out into the deep end. You know, that's where the fun is. As a kid in the swimming pool, the fun was in the deep end. That's where the diving board and all that fun stuff could happen. And that's the same with the Christian life. I mean, when we get into the, the deep waters, that's when... It becomes rewarding. And he goes on in verse 12. He talks about this. I've not already obtained it, and I'm, nor am, am I already perfect, but I press on. This is what I want to talk about. This pressing on. I go hard after it. This is what he's saying. He's not just saying I, I continue. He's saying I press on. It is in the present tense, which means it's an ongoing, continuous 
action for the Apostle Paul. He, he presses on hard is the idea. I'm going after it. And what is he going after? Listen to how he says it. And I don't really like the way the ESV says it. Uh, I like other translations better. But he says, I press on uh, to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Okay. And, th and that is the essence of what it says. I'm not disputing that, that. I just like some of the language that some of the other translations use. I, I really like it. might be the King James. I'm not sure which translation it is that uses the word apprehend. I really like the word apprehend. And uh, that's just my personal preference there. Uh, it's still accurate. I don't mean that. Uh, but this, the idea of, uh, of, of pressing on and uh, the idea of making it my own, that's exactly what the word means. But it's the idea of grabbing on to it, to make it my own. You know, and, and so this is what Paul's saying. Christ pursued me, so I'm pursuing him. Okay? Christ pursued me, and he, he had a specific reason for pursuing me. He wanted a relationship with me, and he had a purpose for my life. And so I want to grab hold of the very thing he grabbed hold of me for, and that is the plan and purpose for my life. I, I want to experience that in this life. And he said, I'm pressing hard after that. I want to fulfill God's purpose for my life. That's what he's saying. I don't know about you. I'm a, I, feel, I feel that way. I want to fulfill what God has called me to do. And God is a sovereign God, and, and that will happen. But I want it. And I know you do too. Or you wouldn't be here if you didn't want it. But Paul wanted it, was willing to pay the price and willing to leave anything behind to obtain it and work to the goal of obtaining it. <laughs> Brothers, he says in verse 13, God, because Jesus Christ has made me his own, because Jesus Christ laid hold of me, he apprehended, he took me into custody, is the idea of the word. Take you into custody. Christ, on the Damascus Road, arrested Paul, is the idea. He took him into custody. And now Paul wants to take Christ into custody, and he wants to, whatever purpose Christ had for his life, he wants that too. And then, brothers, I do not consider that I've made up my own, but one thing I do, notice this, this is a key. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on to the goal of the prize, the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I want you to see three things. First of all was maximum effort. Paul presses on hard. You know, it, it's not based on his effort. His salvation has not based on his effort at all. He's come to understand that. It's by grace through faith. But, but it does, the pursuit of God's purpose for his life requires effort. Now that's effort that the Holy Spirit supplies the power for, but it does require Paul to exert effort. And it's not our human effort that accomplishes it, it's the effort of the Holy Spirit in us that accomplishes it. And so Paul exerts maximum effort. Now I want you to see he has this humility of spirit. He has this humility of spirit. By that I mean he, he sees where he's, he has a realistic view of his life. You know, that's why I challenge you today to look at your life, have a realistic view of it. Where would you put yourself in, in this profit and loss column? Are you putting all your stock in the stuff that you do? Or are you putting all your stock in Jesus Christ himself? If you're not, you're in big trouble. You're going to come up short at the end. You're going to be all in the loss column. But he says this, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call. The upward, the idea of upward is, is above the earth. Okay, there's a call that's coming from upward, and it's a call that's going to take you upward. You know, that's kind of what Paul is saying. For this upward call, that ultimate prize, that ultimate prize is, is Christ-likeness and an eternity in his presence. It's kind of a, I see it as kind of a twofold thing. Not only is it Christ himself is the reward, but then you get fellowship, eternal fellowship. You know, that passage that we led, uh, read a couple weeks ago when I preached talked, talked about that, that where I am, you will also be, you know, kind of similar to John chapter 14. But that's the prize. And so Paul is pressing hard after, and I would just ask us as we wrap up here this morning, what about your own life? You know, where is your faith? Is it in yourself? Is it in your works? Is it in Christ alone? 
And if it is in Christ alone, are you pressing hard after him? Like he pressed hard after you. Let me tell you, you will never be disappointed in making the choices that may require sacrifice in this life, but they'll bring glory in the life to come. You know, you'll never, never regret those kind of choices. Let's pray and have a word. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this passage of Scripture. We thank you for the work that you do in the, the hearts of the lost, not only Paul's life, but our lives as well. As we give our life to you and you change our desires, you change our behavior, you change everything about us. Father, we become a new creation in Christ and we are grateful for that. We pray you would build in us that hunger and a desire to know you deeper, the desire that we see on display in Paul's life. Throughout all of his writings, we see this. And we just pray you'd give us that same desire, that same level of commitment, because we know that you've given us everything we need for life and godliness. We know that you have given us the power to live out the Christian life. It doesn't have to be done on our own human effort. It can't be done on our own human effort, Father. And we pray that in the end, our lives will bring glory and honor to the name of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray.